Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Astro Show, place to be if you're curious about the cosmos. I'm your host, Dr. Sam, the founder and executive director of Wyoming Stargazing. Here, you can pick the brains of astrophysicists, get advice from an aerospace doctor, learn about what astronomers have to say about life, and find out what's going on up above your head all in the same place. So we hope that you join us every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. Mountain Time on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Uh, you can chat your questions on Twitch and YouTube, or you can call in using the information on your screen. We would love to hear from you. You can ask a question, make a comment, or just join the banter of whatever we're talking about. So uh, call in uh, and uh, join the fun. Uh, in this week's show, uh, we have uh, Julia Brady as our special guest. She is the instrument instrumentation engineer for Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena, California. Uh, among other things, she's helped to build specialized robotic detectors for telescopes. And we will hear all about that later on. But before that happens, let's welcome our co-stars. First, Assistant Professor of Physics at the University of Texas at Austin, it's Dr. Nick Galitsky. Hi, everybody. Hey, Nick. 
Next, astronomer and data visualization engineer at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, it's Dr. Lauren Corley. Hi, everyone. Hey, Lauren. Good to have you back. Yeah, feels good. And uh, Dr. Danny is going to be joining us momentarily. Uh, she is an aerospace doctor and founder of Orbital Biodesign, and uh, we look forward to seeing you, Dr. Danny, in just a few minutes. But until then, uh, let's get started with astro advice, life advice from astronomers, astronauts, and other scientists. Here is our quotation for this evening. Uh, as always, I will read it and then ask the co-stars to guess which of the four individuals actually said this. So here we go. The benefits of science are not only material ones. The truths that science teaches are common interest the world over. The language of science is universal and is a powerful force in bringing the peoples of the world closer together. So uh, your options for who actually said that are A, Arthur Compton, uh, American physicist who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1927, uh, for his 1923 discovery of the Compton effect, uh, named after him, uh, which uh, demonstrated the particle nature of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, at the time, the, the wave na nature of light was known well, um, but his experiment um, was one of the first um, observations of the particle nature of light, and he was uh, doing that in, uh, in x-rays if I remembering that correctly. I think we've got a picture of Arthur Compton up on the, the next slides. So we can show you what he looks like. There he is. Uh, the uh, second option for who said this is uh, Charles Messier, a uh, renowned French astronomer who was trying to find comets. And he did find some, uh, 11, I think, uh, are attributed to him. But he's more well known for all the fuzzy things in the night sky that weren't comets. Um, he had no idea what they were, but they turned out to be galaxies, uh, nebulae, star clusters. And we now know of all those objects collectively as the Messier catalog. And probably the most um, well-used astronomical catalog for amateur astronomers like myself um, but I think some professional astronomers use uh, Messier uh, catalog objects as well. So thank you, Charles Messier, for that. Uh, you're probably rolling over in your grave, uh, knowing that we're not remembering you for your comets, but your other things. And we should have a picture of uh, Charles Messier on the next slide. That's your second option, B. Uh, three is uh, Andrea Getz, uh, American astronomer. Uh, and winner of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics for her work on the um, realization that every galaxy in the universe has a supermassive black hole in the center of it. Um, and she shared that prize with uh, Roger Penrose and one other American astronomer whose name I can't remember right now. Uh, Nick, who was that? Wow. Lauren? <laughs> well, well, we'll Google it for you. Uh, there were three of them that shared it. Uh, so there should be a picture of uh, Dr. Getz on the next slide. And uh, last but not least, uh, your fourth option, um, option D, is uh, Lewis Swift, who uh, is an American astronomer who discovered 13 comets, two more than Charles Messier, and 1,248 previously uncategorized nebulae, which makes him the second most prolific nebulae discoverer, second only to William Herschel, who discovered more uh, nebulae visually than Lewis Swift did. Maybe we can bring up the pictures of both uh, Andrea Ghez and uh, Lewis Swift. Should be a couple slides uh, of them. So the next slide should be, there's Andrea Getz. And then next one, there he is, Lewis Swift. Okay, hello, Dr. Danny, welcome. Hey, everybody, good to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, all right, so Danny, we are we are in um, Astro Advice right now. Um, we can, uh, if we go back up a couple slides, you can see the uh, quotation and your four options of who said this. 
Arthur Compton, Charles Messier, Andrea Getz, or Louis Swift. So, co-stars, what say you? Going for uh, Andrea. All right, we got one vote for Andrea. I was thinking that, but I think I'm going to go Lewis Swift. Okay, one vote for Lewis Swift. Danny, you going to buck the trend or uh, all right? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> oh, you're muted. I'll go with B. Okay, Charles Messier. And if we scroll ahead a few slides, we will get to the actual person who said it. One more. It was Arthur Compton. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the diversity of uh, guesses from all three of you. It's too bad we didn't have a fourth co-star. Um, then somebody would have nailed it. But yeah, Arthur Compton, um, who said this. Um, and I, I really like this quotation. I, I've had some issues with previous ones, but uh, this one I, I totally get behind. Um, but I'm curious about what all of you have to say about it. I think it's really interesting that he refers to science as a language. Hmm. That's how I've taken to also describing science, but also math. Because people always be like, oh, I'm very bad at math. But it really is just this language that helps you express the physical world. And we all live in the same world. And so in that way, it is a universal experience that we're all having. So Nice. I agree. Yeah, I, I think that was really well put. Oh, that's all I was going to say. <laughs> Well put, Lauren. Thanks. I was going to emphasize the bringing people together. It's um, despite many international differences in the uh, political realm, there's often scientific collaborations that span them regardless. So um, you know, I work with people all around the world, which is very painful when uh, trying to find a time to meet. But uh, really fantastic to meet all these people. Um, I work with people in Japan and Italy and all these other areas that um, are just driven by the same thing, which is, you know, discovery, um, regardless of the current political climate. Yeah, and that's what really stood out for me as well. You know, I, I think of like, right, the American and Russian collaboration with the International Space Station, or, you know, the, the, the countless, you know, and as Nick mentioned, collaborations that go internationally, despite anything that's going on in the world, um, that um, really do act to bring people together. And, you know, I, I am a Trekkie at heart. I, I love the idea of Gene Roddenberry's that, you know, what, what's held in the future is this like, you know, global um, society when we understand that we're not alone in the universe. And yeah, I, I really do think that that science is that powerful force and has that potential of, of bringing us together, whether or not we actually come in contact with other forms of intelligent life. Um, I feel like there's there's so much that everyone can get behind in understanding the way the world works, regardless of your political persuasion, religious beliefs, etc. It really is a universal language that can help us understand why things are the way they are. I would say, I also think there can be these moments of like, especially things in space where everyone is experiencing the same thing simultaneously, but live. It's like, I'm thinking of the lunar eclipse that happened last night. Yeah. Where it's like not the whole world, but like a large fraction of the world could all go out and look up and like have that same like in-person live experience. And that's just it's really comforting. I moved around a lot, but when you can look up and everything that's in the sky, you can still connect with. It's everyone is doing that at the same time. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that is really like one of the the biggest motivating forces for me in in doing what I do with astronomy education. I really do feel like there are possibilities there of people feeling more well connected to everyone else on Earth because of our common origins. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I feel like NASA has also done a really great job in in making more of those opportunities for people globally, just in terms of like the amazing broadcasts they've been doing of launches and you know, pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope. I feel like all of that like really makes a difference for people and, you know, 
understanding their connections to everybody else. Well, thank you, Arthur Compton, uh, for your work in physics and for this lovely quotation to start us off this evening. So uh, let's move on to Astro 365, this day and week in astrophysics history. So on this day in 1980, not that long ago, JPL announced that the Voyager spacecraft had imaged a new moon orbiting Saturn, bringing the total to 15 moons, uh, which may seem like a really small number <laughs> because uh, as you may or may not know, Saturn is the, the moon king of the solar system, uh, clocking in at 83 moons right now, um, 63 of which are defined, uh, confirmed, and named, 20 of which are still provisional, haven't actually received their, their real names yet. Um, but this little moon that was discovered in uh, 1980 does have a name. Uh, it was originally designated S1980 S28, um, but it is now known as Atlas. And we've got a picture of it for you on the next slide. It is a, oh, actually, so there, there's a picture of the mythological character, Atlas, that it's named after. We'll get to why it was named Atlas in just a moment. Uh, but Atlas is one of the Titans. And as we probably know, at least from the picture of the statue, Atlas was the, the god who was charged with the amazing task of holding up the entire universe on his shoulders um, after the defeat of the Titans. And so this huge responsibility um, of holding the, the entire weight of the universe on his shoulders. And so this little moon, uh, we can go to the picture on the next slide, uh, was named Atlas because when it was first discovered, it was believed to be one of Saturn's shepherding moons, one of the moons that actually hold the rings um, in their shape, um, that don't allow little stray bits of moonlets to waft out into space and make those nice defined edges of the rings. Uh, but it turns out that Atlas is not a shepherding moon. <laughs> uh, there are two other moons that were discovered after Atlas, which have been determined to be actually the gravitational shepherding moods for the ring um, that's, that Atlas is so close to, uh, which I believe is the A ring. I've got a picture of that on the next slide. So Atlas is very, very close to the outer perimeter of the A-ring. So it was believed to be the shepherding moon for the A-ring, uh, but now there are actually two other co-orbital co moons named Janus and um, Epimetheus, uh, which are actually the shepherding moons for the A-ring. Um, but Atlas is still pretty cool. It's got this amazing like flying saucer shape to it. Um, and it's tiny. It's I think it's only like uh, 50 kilometers across. It's a little little itty bitty bit of rock, but still one of Saturn's official 83 moons. Um, Jupiter, by the way, clocks in at 80 moons, just behind Saturn. So they've been kind of like back and forth, um, the king of the moons in the solar system. Um, but yeah, that was um, that was something that happened uh, 1980 on uh, today's date. And uh, now we're going to do everybody's favorite part of tonight's show, the astronomy news quiz. Nick, we've got you up first, and then Lauren, and then Danny. Nick, are you ready? Sure. Let's do it. Okie dokie. This past weekend, astronomers announced a second detection of a black hole during, oh, actually, I screwed this up. I, I had the list wrong. This is for Lauren. Sorry, 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 ah. sorry. My bad, sorry, Nick, <laughs> forget that. You get you get, you get a repose. Lauren, are you ready? <laughs> no, because I read the question and I don't know the answer. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll help you along here. Maybe this is, this is supposed to be fun. You get all kinds of hints and guesses. <laughs> okay, this past weekend, astronomers announced a second detection of a black hole doing what to a previously devoured star? I would have thought it, the black hole was devouring the star, but it already did that. So it already did that. It was like three years ago that it oh. devoured this star, but just recently it did something that nobody expected. 
I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's something that my baby does all the time. Did it spit up? It spit it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 bur it burped it up. Um, yeah, so That's crazy. Um, yeah, so we we have known that there is sometimes these um, you know accretion disks around black holes, which is like the stuff that's actually falling in. But there have now been observations, two of them, that actually show black holes burping up this material out of their accretion disks, right? So it hasn't actually like passed the event horizon and then come back out. That doesn't happen. Um, but somehow it's been expelled from the accretion disk of these two black holes. And um, nobody really understands why that has happened, but this team now has made a second detection of this. And so a um, whole new way of studying black holes, which is pretty cool. Uh, so nice work, Lauren. You got that one correct. So one point for Lauren. Okay, number two. Um, uh, about half um, of the uh, folks in the contiguous uh, 48 states enjoyed clear skies this morning for today's blank, the last in the U.S. until 2025. Lunar eclipse. That was a lunar eclipse. Yeah. It was so cool. Um, did you get to see it, it, Lauren? No, it was like a little bit, it was setting into the west where I am, am in Chicago, oh, like no. too late, and I like wasn't going to be able to see it over the buildings. So. Well, I, I got up at, uh, at 2.30 um, this morning and went outside and watched the whole like hour and a half of totality. And I got some pictures. I'll, I'll share those later oh, on cool. in the show. It was a beautifully clear night here in Nevada. And um, yeah, it was really magical, yeah. actually. Uh, uh, nice work. If two anyone missed it, I know the planetarium did a live stream of the eclipse, so anyone oh, cool. can go on YouTube and like check it out there as well. So oh Very I would love weird. to see that yeah I would love to yeah. see that I was on call last night where do you go to be able to see that, that I clip? think it's on the Adler Planetarium YouTube channel so I think if you just search for them on YouTube you should be able to see the the stream I think they live streamed it there so, oh very awesome. cool yeah. yeah we had um cloudy skies in Jackson so we couldn't live stream it from there and I don't I don't have the technology here in Nevada but yeah I wish I would have because it would have been fun all right, Lauren, you're two for two, going for number three. What stellar phenomena was just discovered by astronomers for the first time completely serendipitously? Mm. Just in the news um, this week. Oh no, but now I wanna know. Stars yeah, do so, lots of weird things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, lots of weird things. They weren't yeah. actually looking for this. They just yeah. happened to notice it. A well-known phenomena, just not caught um, on camera before. Did it eject something? No, it wasn't anything that okay. was um, ejected. It mm. was actually, so here's a hint. So you're on the right track, but it, um, it's, it's not the stuff that was ejected. This is what was actually left behind after something was ejected. Was it some sort of white dwarf? Uh, yeah, Neutron we're going to give star? it to you. A yeah, stellar remnant? It's, it's the collapse, <laughs> I should, I should go the collapse, the the collapse <laughs> core of a massive star. Okay. Yeah, so this star we, uh, is believed to have been about 12 solar masses uh -huh. um, when it was a full star. And uh, just somehow, uh, serendipitously, astronomers got a picture of just the exposed um, core of the star uh, after the, the outer envelope was cast off. Cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, the collapse core of a... Um, um, somewhat larger than sun-like star. Okay, three for three. Nice work, Lauren. All right, Nick, Danny, got your work cut out for you. All right, so now it really is Nick's turn. <laughs> all right, are, are you really ready now, Nick? Yeah, I got, got all warmed up on uh, Lauren. Okay, question. great. <laughs> okay, uh, what soon to be space-based object uh, might begin servicing satellites in geosynchronous orbit by 2025? recently in the news. Well, we it see this. Are they making a, a robot repair ship? No. If they are making a robot repair ship. We'll, we'll give that to you. Do you know who's making the robot repair ship? I don't know. Who's, who's doing Geosync? It's, uh, it, satellite it, company? It's or, DARPA. That's DARPA. Okay. It's DARPA. Yeah. yeah DARPA has this uh, totally cool new robotic arm that's being attached to this other spacecraft uh, designed by a contractor. And yeah, they are gonna launch it in the next couple of years and it will actually be able to repair 
um, geosynchronous orbit satellites, which is pretty amazing. Um, now, I wonder what cool. kind of repair capabilities are built into that. I know, right? Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Uh, go, uh, it goes up there and unplugs them and plugs them back in again. <laughs> yeah, it, it hits the restart button. Power cycle. Nice. Uh, all right, uh, Nick, you got your first question. Here is number two. Um, this one's right up your alley. Um, back from the good old days. In a paper published Friday in the journal Science, the international team using what telescope in Antarctica confirmed that it has found evidence of 79 high energy neutrino emissions coming from around where spiral galaxy NGC 1068 or Messier object 77 is located. That, that'd be Ice Cube. That's Ice Cube! Yeah. Not to be confused with the actor, but actually an <laughs> underground telescope, actually under ice telescope in Antarctica. This is the above ground lab um, mm -hmm. that um, the ice cube, ice cube technicians work in. Um, but yeah, they just uh, found this huge amount of neutrinos. Uh, so neutrinos are these amazing little particles. Billions of them are probably passing through your body right now, but they weakly interact with ordinary matter. And so they're really hard to detect. There have been these um, huge reservoirs of like perfectly pure water used to detect them before. Um, but it turns out that ice is also really, really good. Um, so there's this, um, yeah, amazing telescope buried under, I can't remember how much ice in Antarctica, but a lot. Yeah, it's like a kilometer underneath. A kilometer it? of ice, yeah. And um, so yeah, they just picked up uh, 79 neutrino emissions coming from what they think is a supermassive black hole in the center of this galaxy. Um, but we don't really know all that much about where these neutrinos come from. Um, so this is kind of a cool detection. And yeah, it may open up a whole new realm of astronomy, uh, neutrino detection astronomy. Yeah. So Super high energy ones. I think ones that get them excited. Just Yes. Yeah, and usually quick traveling guys, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, thought that was very cool. All right, Nick, you are two for two, going in for the tie. Cygnus, the cargo ship attached to the Antares rocket, only managed to unfurl one of its two blanks, but NASA still expects it to rendezvous with the ISS tomorrow um, on time. Going, going with my space mode. I'm, I'm guessing solar panels. That's you got it! Going. Yeah, so I there's almost wanted to be solar sail. That sounded a little more romantic, but <laughs> we would have given you a half a point for that. <laughs> so here, here's a picture of um, the previous Cygnus mission. This was Cygnus mm -hmm. 17. Uh, no problem with its two solar arrays. Um, but yeah, Cygnus 18 only got one of those two open. Uh, but uh, yeah, apparently NASA is still going to let it dock with the ISS um, as of today. So hopefully it gets up there because. It is carrying a very cool payload, which we're going to ask Danny about in <laughs> just a few moments. But we got a two-way tie for first place. Three points both for Nick and Lauren. Danny, are you ready for this? I mean, they set the bar really high. <laughs> you got this. We've, we've, we've got okay. some oldies but goodies for you here, okay? Okay. Are right, they we medical? <laughs> the, one of them is medical. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Um, uh, bring up the next question, please. Uh, the, the launch system for which mission rolled back out on the launch pad on November 7th for, oh, excuse me, it was supposed to be yeah, on November 4th uh, for a third launch attempt scheduled for November 14th. Artemis 1. Artemis 1! It's going to happen this time. It's going to happen. Yeah, um, cross your fingers. One week from today, Artemis will be blasting off. Um, I have faith. It's going to happen. I, I do I do too. Be good. Third, third time's a charm. All right. Uh, nice job, Yanni. You got your first one. Here is number two. Last week, uh, anonymous officials from the U.S. Department of Defense spoke to the New York Times to disclose that many recent sightings of blank are likely relatively ordinary foreign surveillance drones. I think you're 
referring to like UFOs, but I believe there's a new term for it. There's that a we're new term. To use. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what's 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 the new term? Mm, I don't remember offhand. Uh, it doesn't. It, it, they kept the U. They just changed the last couple letters. And uh, like un unidentified airborne uh, object uh, or uh, air airborne. I f I can't remember something like that. Unidentified aerial phenomena. There we go. Okay, we're, we're gonna give that to you. It's this is new language. Why NASA had to change UFOs after all these years? I don't understand. There's still UFOs, but now the the PC term to refer to them is unidentified aerial phenomena. I We're think gonna give it to you. this, thank you. This new term kind of incorporates more possibilities, right? So yeah. not necessarily just flying objects, but all sorts of phenomena. Sure, it could be atmospheric phenomena, um, optical illusions, uh, as was the case apparently with those really, really fast spacecraft that were um, videoed by the US Navy. Um, it turns out that they were only going about 48 kilometers an hour. <laughs> it was just the weird <laughs> angle at which those videos were taken that made them look like they were moving really, really fast. So that is an identif unidentified aerial phenomena. Okay, for the three-way tie, here we go. NASA's Antares rocket launched yesterday morning with what exciting piece of new technology for the ISS? And it's, it's a piece that's actually been up there before, but now it's going up there for a second time and it's staying up there. This was on the Cygnus uh, capsule. And, and Danny, the hint that I'll give you is that it, it is medical in design. Oh, there are a lot of possibilities. I'm not sure exactly which one they're referring to. There's some exciting studies that are coming up um, that are about to be performed. So they're going to they're going to do something. They're going to do something um, for the first time in in space repeatedly now um, with this this unit that's being brought up there. They're calling it. It's it's um the, the, they say it's like a whole facility in a box. Mm. I don't know. Maybe minute. maybe run lab like lab tests, blood tests, or something like that. We, yeah, we more exciting into... than that. Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you a hint. Um, we recently used this technology at Wyoming stargazing to make um, a part for one of our cameras that we couldn't find online. Um, okay, so three D a three D printer. But do yeah. you, what, so what they, are they what are they printing though? Maybe tissue. Human tissue. Oh. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the company Redwire uh, has made this uh, incredible uh, contraption that they call uh, the BFF, uh, the Biofabrication Facility, uh, not Best Friends Forever, um, but BFF, the Biofabrication <laughs> Facility. And yeah, they're going to create a human tissue in space, and it's going to permanently live now up on the ISS, which is pretty cool stuff. We have a three-way tie for first place, everybody. Nice work on the news quiz. Excellent job. All right, we are gonna take a short break. And when we come back, we are gonna be here with uh, Julia Brady, um, instrumentation engineer at Carnegie Observatories. Uh, so grab a bite to eat, but uh, come on back in a few minutes. Don't go away.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back. We are here with our special guest, Julia Brady, instrumentation engineer at the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena, California. And Julia, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And uh, we, we are remiss because we did not do the What's Up, Dr. S uh, What's Up, Dr. Sam uh, segments. So we're going to do that real quick, and then we will get back with Julia Brady for our special guest spot. So uh, if you if you didn't catch it uh, early this morning, there was a total lunar eclipse all over most of the United States. It was pretty awesome. Uh, I woke up early, set my alarm, uh, got these pictures. Uh, the one on the left is just near the end of totality, um, kind of zoomed in on the moon. And the one on the right, um, I zoomed out and just was able to sneak in the Pleiades cluster at the very top of the image. I don't know if you can see that. Um, it was pretty hard to get uh, the moon not overexposed with the Pleiades. I did a little Photoshop magic on that, but um, no, I managed to, to get that. So it was really, really beautifully clear here in, um, in Nevada. So I was able to get those shots, but I just wanted to say a little bit about why this happened and why we called it the the beaver blood moon. Um, so you're probably seeing there are all these different names of new moons, or excuse me, full moons uh, that have been popularized recently. Some of them actually have reasonable names for good reasons. Uh, this one is called the, the beaver moon, the, the first full moon of November, because it's around the time that beavers will go into their lodges for the rest of the winter having stockpiled food for the entire winter. Not always, not exactly the first week of November, but that's where the, the beaver moon comes from. Um, it's called the blood moon because the moon gets red when it goes into a total lunar eclipse. And um, this image kind of shows you um, why we have lunar eclipses to begin with. As you probably know, the moon is going around the earth. It completes one orbit every month. Um, by the way, that used to be the word moonth which is why we call it a month or month, one orbit of the moon around the earth. Uh, and every so often it lines up perfectly in the same plane as the earth and the sun. And the next picture shows that. So if it were always on the same plane, we would get a total lunar eclipse and a total solar eclipse almost every month. Um, but because the moon's orbital plane is inclined to that with respect to the sun and the earth, it only lines up every so often. And so uh, we only get a total lunar eclipse or solar eclipse every so often. Um, so you can kind of see that in the diagram here. So a really cool experience last night. Um, it's the last one that's going to go across the United States like it did um, until 2025. So you got a few years to wait for the next one. But if you miss this one, check out the images, but um, get out there next time to see the next total lunar eclipse in 2025. All right, um, now let's get back to our special guest, Julia Brady. Uh, Julia, thank you so much for being here. And um, as always, we like to start off the guest spots with the same question, uh, which is, what's the one question that you wish everybody would ask you, but nobody ever does? Oh, I love this question. Um, and I think my, uh, I wish somebody would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew, grow up. Um, People used to ask that all the time. <laughs> and then, you know, I'm 25, I graduated college and I think everyone's like, oh, you figured it out. But I don't know, I love my job, but I still, I still wanna be an astronaut. Like I still have that hope one day, you know, everyone's doing it now. Like everyone's going to space, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my chance to go up there. <laughs> and uh, I just wish somebody would ask that because I could talk about that for so long. <laughs> Well, let's let's start right there then. Um, Julia, what would you like to be when you grow up? I want to be an astronaut and <laughs> everything I've done <laughs> for a very long time has been like a stepping stone to get me up there. Um, it's why I was, I went to school to be an aircraft mechanic and then I went to college um, for astronomy and astrophysics. And it's why I'm an instrumentation engineer now, just so like NASA, SpaceX, Ad Astra, somebody's going to look at my resume and be like, that's who we're going to send to space. <laughs> nice. Well, yeah. Best of <laughs> luck for that. I, I hope that we get to ask one of our trivia questions about you going up into space sometime soon. 
I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> It'll be soon, but one day. Yeah. I mean, soonish. Yeah. We're, we're talking like, you know, cosmological time here. It's all kinds of time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how did you um, get into astronomy and what has your, your path been so far that um, brings you where you are? Sure. Yeah. Um, I got into astronomy. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. So you hear about the Wright brothers constantly. There's also Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And I grew up to next to the Dayton International Airport. So I just saw planes constantly in the moon. And I just was like, I want to get up there one day. So I just was always looking up there and wondering, you know, what's up there. Um, because, you know, especially as a kid, you don't know the sky's blue. And then at night there's stars. So as I got older, I just wanted to keep looking and keep seeing what was there. So I went to school to be an aircraft mechanic, like I said, and then because I wanted to know how planes worked. And I was like, I want to work on, you know, shuttles one day. So then I went to college um, and was going to be an engineer, but I quickly learned I did not love the um, time spent in front of a computer as an engineer. And um, I just... I was so used to working with my hands. I needed to be moving. I couldn't, the theory was difficult uh, for some reason, just to like kind of slow your brain down and, you know, think instead of constantly be doing. Um, so I changed my major to astronomy and astrophysics, which is kind of the same thing, a lot of research and a lot of sitting down. But because I did that, I actually met Dr. Rick Pogge, who some of you may know, um, who is uh, the vice chair at Ohio State for the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And he ran, uh, runs the uh, instrument science or imaging sciences lab. I always say it wrong. Um, but that's how I got my job working on telescope instruments and anything that's going to be looking up into the sky. Um, and uh, that job led me here to Pasadena and at Carnegie, where I just get to work with my hands every single day and I get to design things and do what I love every single day. I'm very lucky. Nice. So what, um, what, uh, sorry, are you actually working on um, telescopes or other instrumentation right now? I work on all of it, but primarily right now, I just finished my work for the Sloan uh, Digital Sky Survey 5. Um, I, at Ohio State, I was in charge of doing the focal positioner systems, the FPS, and all of the robots. There were 500 in each one, and there were two, you know, instruments. And uh, I was in charge of writing the book on how those were going to go in, how they were going to be integrated, how you were going to track them down inside of the plane, and how each one had three fibers coming out of it, and how each one of those was going to be plugged in, and the data was going to be taken from them. And it was a lot, especially um, this was like my senior year. It was COVID. It was a lot of work. Um, sorry, you might be able to hear my dog right now. Um, but that's uh, what I just finished up. I was just in LCO in August helping, um, which is Los Campanas Observatory in Chile, helping um, install it and the BOSS spectrograph, which is going to be helping take data from that and go on down the pipeline. And now I'm still kind of working for uh, SDSS-5 with the uh, local volume mapper um, system of spectrographs and their telescopes. So I'm just, I'm not doing a lot of work on the telescopes. That sounds like a lot of fun, but it's happening in Germany. Um, so I'm going to be here and I'm working on the spectrographs, which are um, really interesting, but really expensive. And a lot of things can go wrong. So I've been very careful making sure that I'm doing everything exactly right for them. Nice. Um, the, uh, the, the focal plane systems that you were uh, talking about a few minutes ago are really cool looking devices. I saw some pictures of them and I think you, you shared some of those with us, right? Can we bring some of those up and- uh, Yeah, I think it's kinda... the second picture I posted. Um, Gavin, if you could please bring that up. Yeah, let's take a look Oop, at that. Not that one. It should be a bunch of fibers. Nope. <laughs> I'm sorry. There we go. Right there here. <laughs> so I don't have a picture of the robots up, but these are all of the fibers that come out of them that have to be routed very carefully. They're all there. Some of those fibers are two millimeters and that's just, you know, the shell around the actual fiber, which is like a hair. It was so fragile. Every single day was like a panic attack, like on the verge <laughs> of a panic attack as you carefully handled these things. 
And there's so many of them. It takes months to put together and you have to do it on the inside as the robots connect. And then on the outside, there's even more that go through and just have to be perfect or you don't get the throughput that you're expecting. And then they have to be patched or somebody yells at you and you have to go down and you have to change out the slit head, um, which I actually did in October, but not because I broke anything. They just <laughs> built a new monolithic glass slit head. So, um, but there's so much that goes into it and it's, but it's going to get all this data and that's, you know, this field is changing constantly. So they're always hoping to look further, deeper, look at something new. And that's what instruments like this are made for. They take, I mean, <laughs> they're funded for like five years and they take five years to make. And by the time they're ready, you're like hoping that, you know, you're going to be on the cutting edge and that you'll get more funding to last even longer. Um, but I love it. I don't do a lot of the research and stuff like that, but I'll build it anytime you ask me to <laughs> anything you want. I'll put it together. Nice. Um, I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more of the details about like how these, these fibers and the robotic um, detectors actually work with the, the systems they're going to be integrated with. Sure. Um, I can't answer a lot for the programming, but I can tell you, you know, the each robot is around a foot um, long and they have the ferrule at the top, which holds all three fibers together, um, just tiny, you know, little cylinders of glass. And they all have to be put in by hand. You have to develop a system so that you know, because these all turn. It's not like um, previously we used plug plates and those were stationary. They had to be done by hand. And uh, now the robots all turn. So the fibers have to go in them in a certain way so that they're not going to be broken because the robot turns the wrong way. So coming together, you feed it up through the robot. And then at the end, there's another circuit board that connects to the system and it all you know, so everything can talk and we can position it so it tracks a star across the sky. And uh, then at the bottom, the fibers come out and they connect on the back side of that grid. These are from the outside. On the inside is the same thing with uh, three fibers, uh, BOSS, metrology, and apogee. And you have to keep them all, you know, correct. Things go wrong. Light goes down, you know, a certain fiber that's not a science fiber. Anything can happen. So you just carefully go one by one and you put it together. Nice. Yeah. So let's see, I think I remember, so one of these, um, one of the systems you built went to um, Chile mm -hmm. that you mentioned. And I think there was another one that went to New Mexico, right? Yep, Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. <laughs> um, I did not get to go with that one when it was installed because it was during COVID, but it's the same thing um, like I did in LCO where it's just a very heavy system. Um, I think the next picture might show this. Um, yep, <laughs> it's a, you know, a couple hundred pounds and working on it. Um, you know, when you're getting it ready to install and when you're installing it, you have to get underneath it and you have to trust that the, uh, I don't know, the two inch <laughs> diameter steel rods that are holding it on this system so that it will rotate are going to hold it when you're underneath it. So that's me underneath that. And I always feel like the Wicked Witch of the East, I think it is, <laughs> in uh, Wizard of Oz when she gets smashed because a coworker took this picture and I had no real idea what it looked like. And it's just cracks me up to see my legs sticking out of there. Um, but yeah, we go to, you know, Apache Point or LCO and we install them. We have to make sure everything's safely lifted because anything can be you know, smashed in an instant. These things weigh a ton and they're all, they have all these guide pins, but you run into issues when engineers don't talk to each other or there's some weird, like, it's like a trade secret sometimes between institutions like Carnegie and Ohio State didn't talk exactly the way they needed to. So we had to like create things on the fly and like, you know, grind metal down so that things didn't break and cause this like million dollar thing to just be garbage. <laughs> so like I said, sometimes it was like every day was like right on the verge of a panic attack where you're just like, it's going okay. It's going okay. <laughs> you're just hoping it stays that way. And so are they, are they, um, are both these um, systems operational now or are they getting, getting close? Yes. No, they are all both installed and going through, um, I can't think of the word right now, 
but they're they're getting light down them. We've had first light. We're getting all of the calibrations. Um, APO, I believe, is taking data, and LCO is in the process of making sure that the new glass slit head that we put in the boss spectrograph is uh, has a high enough throughput that it was worth all the money we spent on it and that I don't have to fly back down and put the old slit head back on, which would be <laughs> a lot of work and a lot of money as this uh, survey is kind of, you know, ending or at least the construction part of it and we're running out of money, you know, to be ready to start taking data instead of us still trying to beat our head against the wall to fix problems that shouldn't be there. Well, um, I'll cross my fingers on that one for you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, so what's next? You, you finished up with these detectors. Um, what's your next big project? So, um, LVM is going to take us into February. Um, we have, uh, this whole new observatory building that's being built at, um, Las Campanas up there. and, uh, it's all being built and it's going to take you know, four weeks of us down there, making sure everything goes in together, the spectrographs, the telescopes, and hopefully that's done, I want to say by May. But after that, I really don't know. We have um, GMT actually just moved in to Carnegie on Monday, so I'm probably going to be working with them. Um, that's the Giant Magellan Telescope? Giant Magellan Telescope, yes, um, which has been in process for years, and they're finally um, cause they're actually at Las Campanas as well. So they actually have, you know, the construction site is ready. They have the dorms built for the construction workers. People are actually on the site. Hopefully stuff is going to be moving and it's not just going to be, you know, this grand plan that everyone's had for years. Um, <laughs> that's just not going to see the light of day. Everything's moving and hopefully that'll be my next step. Um, and it's going to be a really big deal. You know, a lot of new images and data is going to be taken from it. And I'd love to work on it. And I think that's where I'll end up. Very cool. Yeah. I'm really lucky. I uh, was hired by Carnegie Observatories themselves and not one project. So I don't have to, you know, follow another project or try to find a new job when this one's over. I just get to stay there and work on whatever they need me to or whatever I want. That's awesome. What do you think about Pasadena? I love it. Right now, it's it's been pouring for the last two days straight, which is the most <laughs> rain I've seen since I moved here in January. Um, <clears throat> and it's also really cold. It's like 50 degrees. <laughs> and uh, it was like 90 up through like mid-October. And when I moved here from Ohio, I got rid of a ton of winter stuff. <laughs> so I don't know. I like Pasadena, but it's expensive. <laughs> so I'm happy just with my little apartment for now. Nice. Yeah, I've only been there once. I've been to Los Angeles a number of times, but only out mm -hmm. to Pasadena once. I, I got invited to the um, the 100th anniversary of the uh, the Hooker Telescope on Mount Wilson. Oh, um, yeah. The one that uh, the Hubble used. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so it was it was really cool to go up there. And um, yeah, it was the middle of the summer for the, um, the celebration. But yeah, it was cold up on the top of Mount Wilson. Yeah, I'm sure really they've got a lot of snow today um, yeah. because it it was just crazy, this weather. But I uh, I love it. Um, I love working for Carnegie. There's so many people that work there. I get to work with the best. Um, I get to work with Alan Uemoto, who is our kind of electronics engineer. Um, he's done a lot of work, um, you know, throughout his career. And I'm so lucky I get to work with him and all, everybody at Carnegie. Nice. Any, um, any questions from any of the co-stars for Julia? Or comments or anything in between those? I'm curious what projects you work on nowadays besides these telescopes. Like, do you, it seems like you do it for fun. So are there any other <laughs> odd projects that you're building too? Um, I don't know if you've heard of Henrietta or Miramos. They're kind of similar. Um, Henrietta is kind of the... Um, test for Miramos, which is a new system of lenses. Um, but I got to work on new roll pin flexures to kind of hold the lenses um, that hadn't really been done before. It had been done once by Steve Smee, and he wrote an SBIE paper on it, and that's what I used as a guide. But um, <laughs> sorry, my dog is not happy. Um, I mean, if but, he's a little guy that you can like lift up and show us, you can do that. She weighs 55 pounds. Oh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> so I cannot. 
<laughs> and my my dog's right behind me sleeping. I can hear him snoring, but he weighs 70 pounds. So I won't be showing him either. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I work on these telescopes and I mean, it is my job. This is what I have to, I have to do it every day, but I also love to do it. Um, and, uh, as fun as it is, I just, I, I love it. Um, but I did, you know, I did these new roll pin flexures, um, which were really interesting. They hadn't been, they'd been done before, but not to the point that we could just instantly replicate them. I had to do a lot of engineering and built a calculator on solid works and all this design work. And then it didn't get used um, because we hired an optomechanical engineer who like that was his specialty. And I was like, well, I'm glad it's getting done correctly, but also I put a lot of time into that. <laughs> so a lot of odd projects like that. Um, but because it's such a small field and uh, it's not like we just have, you know, a fleet of engineers like maybe JPL or anything like that. I just do whatever they need me to, and I get to work on everything, and I love that. Uh, nothing's ever the same, which makes me really happy because I get bored a little easily sometimes. <laughs> right on. Uh, well, I, I'm I'm curious about whether or not you you do like hobby building as well. I mean, maybe Danny was pointing to that, but like, ah, you know, if, yeah, if you, if you have, like have a little like side projects that you just work on for your your own personal pleasure. Yeah, I. I love, like I said, working with my hands. So right now my new, not my new thing, but the thing I've been working on the most is um, like pattern making and like sewing my own clothes. Oh, cool. It's just really interesting to see the pattern that doesn't look like a garment and you have to put it all together. You have to fold things a certain way. And uh, I love it. Oh my gosh. It's so much fun. It is not any cheaper than buying clothes. Um, fabric <laughs> is expensive. <laughs> So I don't do it for that, but it's just really fun. That's like my main thing right now. If I'm not working, I love to just kind of just keep putting things together. I, I think a lot of hobbyists would tell you that it's not cheaper to build any of the things that they build as opposed to just buying them. The, the same is definitely true for telescopes. I've, I've, I've built a couple of telescopes myself. Oh, yeah. And they were way more expensive than what I could have just bought off the shelf. Yeah, <laughs> not, yeah. Not me, nearly as much fun. Wave, you know, they they have everything you need, but it's uh, it's a, lo a lot more expensive if you just do it without them. Yeah. Totally. Well, we are just about out of time. Um, Julia, anything else you want to share with us from either your your path to um, that brought you to where you are today, or any advice you have for other aspiring engineers or astronomers, or anything like that? Hmm. I I think I would say to just really think about instrumentation. Um, I didn't know about it until just I happened to have a half hour talk in a class by Dr. Pogi who talked about it and he had this love for it and that I wanted to see what he was so happy about. But a lot of people don't think about instrumentation. They think about the data, you know, and how they look at it and how they're gonna analyze it and run a code. But there's so much that goes into, you know, getting that data, you know, instrumentation, we have to work on this design and these reviews and then prototypes and building it for years until we finally get that first light. And I just think if we get more people into it, we're just going to create bigger and better things. Nice. Yeah. Was it something like, I don't remember how many thousands of people all worked on the James Webb Space Telescope over a 30 year time period. And like, and yeah, most of it was all instrumentation. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, now people just are seeing these images. They're seeing the data. But, you know, it's just a lot of people don't think about how we get it. And I, I hope people start doing that, especially now that, you know, James Webb and images and pictures of the telescope itself, you know, and everything that went into it are being out there on the Internet. They're easily accessible. So I hope that starts, you know, something new. Likewise. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get... Um some students who I'm working with into instrumentation um, at the moment, we're, we're doing this, um, this high altitude weather balloon curriculum, mm -hmm. but I'm having the kids design the, the payloads and they're gonna use Arduinos 
um, to oh. collect um, environmental readings. So they're they're mm -hmm. learning how to like code Arduinos right now, mm -hmm. these little circuit boards. For those of you who don't know what Arduinos are, and they're going to be um, they're going to be implementing different environmental sensors on the um, Arduinos and altimeters, and um, yeah, to see what kind of data they can collect. Um, from, from these high altitude weather balloons are going to launch um, the next mm -hmm. couple months. That's exciting. Um, yeah. I see there's also a question from YouTube. Uh, yeah, what do we have to look forward to in telescope technology in the near future? Um, hmm. good That's question. a good question. I think we're going to see a lot more of the robotic arrays, maybe like um, the FPS showed because it's, or what I worked on with Sloan, because it was, you know, before we had hundreds of plug plates, you know, we had these things that, you know, a set of like four people sat in a room and just plugged fibers into a plate. That's where they get their name. But we had hundreds of them because we needed a new one to look at different spectra or in a different object constantly, depending on the science. Um, so I think maybe robots might be a lot more common as, you know, finicky as they are, as you know, how many it would take to do something like that. Um, I think we're going to see them a lot more because they they're just unbeatable. You know, when they work correctly and they move and they follow across the sky. Um, yeah, I think maybe we're also we're also going to see a lot more just uh, a lot maybe less ground based observing for telescopes. I think with um, stuff like Starlink and all this like noise that we are starting to get from, you know, satellites and stuff in our atmosphere. It's not crazy to imagine we're going to start looking outside off of Earth, you know, just like the James Webb. So I can definitely see that happening. Yeah, I, I'm sure there are some commercial firms who are thinking moon-based telescopes. <laughs> I'm sure there are. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of that <laughs> just because it's, uh, um, I don't know, like, can't we have something sacred? Can't we have the moon <laughs> to look at and not commercialize? Um, did you, did you see Ad Astra? The movie what Ad did they, Astra? Oh, no, what did they do? Uh, so yeah, so a very, very dark and dismal um, preview of what they think the moon might be like in a hundred years or so. Uh, picture the moon with an Applebee's. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like an and, April Fool's joke. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, this is, yeah, I mean, and like, like rampant warfare um, on the far oh, side. Oh, good. That yeah, yeah. was not, not a good picture of what um, space colonization might be in 100 years. Yeah, uh, not a fan of that. Um, uh, Nick, it looked like you were going to say something there. No, oh, there's two things on the plug plates. It's, uh, it's too bad they're moving the robots. So that's going to mean that the abundance of end tables for physics and astronomy labs is going to disappear. Oh my gosh, yes. So anybody I know that has worked on the plug plates uh, got a decommissioned one and I have seen them hung everywhere. People make tables out of them. They're in offices. Those giant discs are like a point of pride with a lot of people, which is wonderful. <laughs> but they're also, you know, it takes a lot of work to make one of those. What are, what are astronomers going to do without those end tables? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Nick and Lauren, you've both been involved in some pretty amazing new telescope projects. Do you want to say a little bit about the projects that the two of you have worked on? Uh, sure. Yeah, no, I'm, well, yeah, I guess working on instrumentation and pictures of me hanging out underneath heavy telescope cameras as well. Um, lakes yeah. sticking out. Heavy. <laughs> but uh, also down in Chile, but we're a little farther to north up near Alma. Um, okay doing that sort of thing. I was going to say the technology that's making the biggest difference for us very specifically is um, a type of electronics that that is, you know, advances that makes our computing and our data collection a lot easier for larger mm -hmm. arrays, uh, specifically field programmable, field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs, uh, which have reached higher densities and allowed us to do a lot, a lot more than we could previously. So Mm -hmm. There's also major advances in the electronics and computing side that open up new new possibilities for telescopes. That's wonderful and exciting. Indeed.
Yeah, and for us, I was working at the Rubin Observatory until a little while ago. So this is also a telescope down in Chile um, that's going to try and image the entire southern sky every three nights. Uh, and the way wow. that it's doing that is by building this really large but compact telescope that can move really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And by putting like the biggest digital camera that's ever been built that we know about <laughs> on top like of it. the size of a car, right? It's about the size of a, a, yeah, Volkswagen Beetle. And the thing that never ceases to blow my mind is that most, a lot of cameras are like behind the primary, ours hangs over above it. So it's this like giant eight meter mirror that we're like, we'll hang a car above it. Yeah. And <laughs> Um, but I think the camera was fully assembled recently over the summer. Um, and so they're going to be able to ship it down to Chile and start commissioning it probably sometime in, I don't know, maybe a year and a half from now, I think. So that'll be really exciting too. So. Nice. And like, you know, the other, like, I think like, um, like associated thing that we're going to get from a lot of this new telescope technology is just big data, right? I mean, yeah. talk about like, you know, what we're going to get from the Vera Rubin telescope and James Webb. Th there's going to be so much data that it will be, you know, what, decades until we are able to sift through it, even with like really good computer algorithms. So like, there are going to be new advances in like in data mining um, from, from all these new instruments that are coming online. And like, that's going to be like a whole new field in, its, in itself. Yeah, but I, I was also looking at some uh, some reports about new prototype telescopes that were made out of like small little particles of metal suspended and shaped by magnetic fields, like in in orbit around the Earth. Yeah, I'll have to go back and remember <laughs> where I, I read this. It was it was legit. It was like a like a, a NASA project. Huh. Um, but yeah, like these like enormous enormous mirrors right that are that are made of these like little bits of reflective particles that are shaped through magnetism and basically they have they have no like physical extent that they're limited to um as long as you can create a big enough magnetic field and you have like a big enough swarm of particles that you can shape so yeah there's going to be some really cool stuff um coming up with telescope technology in the next several decades. Uh, we, we also had a question uh, from Tim B. Um, but by the way, thank you, uh, Christopher Mendoza, for that first question. Uh, Tim B. asks, what's your dog's name? <laughs> oh, <laughs> this is Huckleberry. She comes up here. She's a little baby. Uh, she's a lab and pit bull mix. Aww. And uh, I think everybody sees the name Huckleberry and assumes she's a boy. But nope, it's a, it's a girl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got a pity mix behind me too. He's a, he's like a quarter pit bull and then he's got like 13 different breeds. Yeah. Yeah. She's a bit of a mutt, but that's okay. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, Julia, I'm going to give you the last word. Any, any words of um, wisdom or anything else you want to uh, leave us with tonight? I don't know. I guess really going back to my, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. I, I think we don't have to pick one thing. I think it's very exciting, especially, you know, in the time we live in where we can do anything we want, you know, spend a couple of years doing one thing, do another, if you have, I mean, the money or the resources, but you don't have to feel stuck and it's exciting, you know, to get to do something new. And I'm, I'm lucky that I have all these ideas and I, I have the drive for it. Cause I'm, I'm going to learn it all and I'm going to see it all. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, I, that is great advice and uh, best of luck to you in uh, making all that happen. Thanks. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure to chat with you this evening. Um, thanks so much. We've got a, a thank you gift for you and our operations director, Maggie, will connect with you on that. So yeah, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And uh, thanks as always to the co-stars for being here. We wouldn't have a show without you. So Thank all of you so much for your time as well. We really appreciate it. And to all the other folks behind the scenes, Gavin, our stream master, uh, the board of directors of Wyoming Stargazing that supports the Astro Show, and all of you out there at home watching. Uh, Tim B. and Christopher Mendoza, thanks so much for your questions this evening. Uh, we hope to hear from the rest of you sometime soon on the Astro Show. 
and we'll see you back here in a couple weeks. But until then, be well, and don't forget to look up. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you.